So before we get started, Nicholas, I just wanted to say a little bit about Nicholas. Uh, he's founding director of Create Streets. And as you know, its mission is uh, about gentle density. And Nicholas and colleagues have been really flying the flag for this for some years now and um, doing a, really a lot of excellent work to really draw our attention to the importance of good design um, in placemaking. Nicholas is also a commissioner of Historic England. He's an academician of the Academy of Urbanism. And as you probably know, Nicholas was appointed fairly recently to lead the government's task force uh, to embed beauty in the planning system. And he's working with local authorities to develop legally binding design codes. But really it's Nicholas's role as head of um, Create Streets that he's joining us with, um, joining us tonight. Um, and I should also say that Nicholas is a long-term friend of, of, of our unit and of, of the, the university and actually, um, the International Garden Cities Institute, where I also work, and uh, with his colleague Letitia Lucy, wrote a really excellent perspectives paper for us some time ago called Our Cities Good For You. Um, and the links that they made there between urban form and wellbeing were really beautifully um, drawn, very much uh, worth reading. So I do hope you'll look out for that. So it's absolutely wonderful to be able to, uh, to introduce Nicholas tonight to discuss bringing democracy forward through co-design of locally distinctive design codes. But before I ask Nicholas to speak, I also wanted to, to, to welcome, um, and really ha very happy to welcome and to introduce another old friend of the University of Hertfordshire, Miss Vanessa Gregory, who's really through Vanessa's good offices that this whole seminar came together. Uh, Vanessa Gregory leads Looks and Albans. Um, and as some of you may know, Vanessa's um, been a real leader on um, design and place-focused engagement, uh, doing groundbreaking and, in fact, award-winning work on charrettes, including one for Central St Albans. I'm really pleased to say I've more recently managed to, to persuade Invable uh, Vanessa to start uh, doing some guest lecturing for us on our Sustainable Planning Master's Program, and she was absolutely brilliant. Um, and so Vanessa's also bringing an exemplary uh, you know, experience and knowledge to bear on thinking about design-related engagement themes, including locally distinctive design codes. So I'm looking forward to um, hearing the latest from, from Nicholas. Please do put any questions into the, into the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on those. And when Nicholas has, has finished his presentation, uh, there'll be, we'll be opening up the floor for, um, for those questions to Nicholas. Um, and I, I think Nick, um, Vanessa and I may start that off with one question each from us before we open it up to, to, to all of you. So please, Nicholas, um, I'm not sure if you're going to be um, sharing slides, but please do that if you're, um, I think you should be able to do that as your co-host. Um, take it away. Uh, Susan, um, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. And, <clears throat> you know, I should say, uh, you know, I know some of the conversations we had, Susan, some years ago, I found incredibly helpful and inspiring um, at a stage when, Lots of people in the academic and policy space you know, some years ago, I'm afraid we're saying to talk about what people like and find beautiful and find homely and comfortable is just silly. It's a waste of time. It's a distraction. You know, you were one of the, the few who didn't. So, you know, thank you. Uh, and also to Vanessa, uh, and I, please, uh, I hope Vanessa will, I can spare her blushes, but, um, you know, the, the work that you, Vanessa, and I suspect others on the call uh, did some years ago now, uh, you know, on design in St Albans is genuinely one of the uh, developments that I've been aware of. I mean, I think literally since I started Create Streets, or certainly, short, certainly shortly thereafter, and which I have found consistently genuine and you know profoundly inspirational. So you know, uh, without caveat or or or, uh, or constraint, you know, thank you and well done to Vanessa. And as I say, I suspect uh, so quite a few of you on the call. So um, that that's a you know <laughs> stop now basically i've got nothing else interesting to say let me try and share my screen uh, i hope i can do this always the moment of risk um has that come up okay fine thank you i'm just going to try and make it full screen bear with me my my laptop is slightly struggling at the moment after you know not being turned off for a few weeks yeah, and it's, generally it's, having too much stuff open is that is that okay can you see that yes it is nicholas brilliant. thank you brilliant thank you so um You've asked me to just talk about you know, bringing democracy forward, which was one of the uh, phrases that um, I guess we used on the uh, the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. And what I how I've interpreted that, I hope this is OK. Uh, Vanessa may have seen a few of these slides before, so I apologise, Vanessa. Um, I thought I'd actually just talk about some of the things that have been happening recently on design and planning policy, which I think are relevant to that. I'll specifically speak about uh, the report we published uh, a, well, I can say a year ago, it's over a year ago, now. it almost feels like a lifetime ago because it was just before you know, the world changed, uh, the, the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission report. And then I'll talk about some of the things that have been happening in the last few months. Um, 
and then I'll hopefully if I and, and you know Susan you must shut me off as soon as I'm talking for too long which I can easily do um, now if we're all in the same room and hopefully that's the sort of thing that will be possible soon I would all ask you to shout out numbers uh, to this but you're all muted so you can't um, uh, in a way, it doesn't matter what the precise answer to this question is, that the latest American Meta study, by the way, says that it's about 40% of our health is a function of where we live, um, you know, the air we breathe, how much we walk, how secure we feel as we take the, uh, the journey from the train station to home or whatever it might be. Uh, so we'll come into that in more detail. But I guess the key point I keep trying to make you know, to anyone who will listen is that place matters. And if you don't, if you don't believe the science, uh, look at where people live. You can find very consistent patterns in the types of places that more prosperous people live in versus less prosperous, and that's because they are perfectly reasonably exercising their right of choice, and you know they've got the money to to do so, and that's why uh, rich people tend to live in certain types of places, and put crudely, uh, you know, less prosperous people tend to live in small, ugly flats by busy roads, just like this one here. Um, so. And, and you know there are provable links, which I'll come to later, between place, health, and well-being, and how likely we are to know our neighbours, how uh, secure we feel uh, when we're at home. And uh, again, perhaps put a little bit simplistically, uh, the reason I set up Create Streets, and I set it up about seven years ago now, uh, it's my second career, uh, was I came to the view, which I would still hold to very securely, though I think it's getting a little better now. The situation that too many of the places we create and the ways that we steward our existing settlements are not, I was going to say maximising, they're not even optimising uh, well-being and health for those people who live in them. And that, that is something that we as a society you know, both can and should aspire to fix. So if you like, that, that's why I'm here. That's what I try and do. Um, uh, that's, the sort of, that's the pitch. Um, these are the things that are going on. Um, I can't see you all now because I've, I've minimised your screen. So if this is all getting dull, then Susan, you must, you must just interrupt. But what I thought was I'd just quickly talk you through some of these things and then I'll, then I'll try and shush. Um, so the, the, these are the, the, like the, the, the moments over the last couple of years. Uh, the first was the publication by the government, uh, under a bit of pressure from people such as myself and others, of the National Design Guide. I think in all honesty, though it's a perfectly good and fine document, I wouldn't sort of criticise it, it's not, it doesn't particularly have teeth. Um, it doesn't really, I think, particularly it can have huge influence in terms of planning decisions. I can't imagine it's something that um, uh, many of our friends, the Volume House Builders, have paid huge attention to. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard one of them mention it to me. Um, the second, uh, oh, hang on, why is that? That's actually in the wrong place. So I, I'll, come, I'll come back to the, oh, yeah, there it is. There's the, there's the National Design Guide. Um, and uh, it created, I think, a useful uh, framework of, uh, of ideas, which has been picked up by the National Design Code, of which more later. Um, the second thing that's happened over the last couple of years, and forgive me, I'm probably going to talk about this at slightly too great a length because I, I helped run it in the end, uh, was the, the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, uh, which led to the, the Living with Beauty report uh, just over a year ago in January of last year. Um, I think it'd be fair to say that at its inception, it was quite controversial. It was certainly widely criticised uh, by I think most in the, the design world and, and by many in the development world, over the course of a bit over a year, I think that the situation turned around quite fundamentally so that by the time we published last year, um, actually it was met with almost universal support. I think the only people I'm aware of who came out against it publicly were the chair of one uh, PLC house builder and a couple of um, architectural journalists, everyone else either completely or, or widely support or slightly supported it. And I think it has had some impact as we'll uh, investigate in a moment into uh, the white paper and some of the things the government has done subsequently. Um, well, there were th three or four of us commissioners, a dozen or so advisors, but we tried very hard to if you like, get out beyond that. So we ran um, we had many visits. Uh, we had lots of responses to our uh, call for evidence, which I think one came from uh, Lux and Albans, which thank you. Met many experts, met many community groups and set up uh, eight further working groups with a wider range of people to go into more detail. And you can see on the map where we visited. If I'm honest, we probably didn't go to the far northeast and northwest quite enough. But I think we've got a good mix of different types of place and um, different economics in terms of uh, the competing pressures of land versus development costs. Uh, this was the sort of, if you like, the context of the challenges we had. Um, there's obviously a need for new homes, particularly in the southeast. Uh, uh, a need to be carbon neutral. Uh, some might say sooner than that, but that's you know that's uh, 2030 to 2050. That that is, uh, I think, is broadly agreed. Uh, the need to end the scandal left behind places, as many of you will know, the British economy is 
is oddly regionally disproportionate in terms of where the prosperity is and isn't. There are actually some quite good geographical reasons for that, which aren't really any one government's fault, i.e. lots of the places that became big towns and cities in the 19th century were very well positioned for, you know, coal or access to water, which is less relevant now, why Milton Keynes is arguably more successful. Um, you know, so it's not, one can't entirely blame one government, but nevertheless, I think uh, a realisation that there has been a very disproportionate uh, taking of the national growth pie over the last generation or two. Um, and then I think the the, the, the growing realisation that we need to be far, far more uh, thoughtful about the mental health impacts of the way we live, perhaps particularly on the youngest generation. And I think we'd add to that now clearly the question, well, what, what impact will the COVID crisis have? In a nutshell on that, it, it seems probable but not certain that it will, at least for a generation, uh, reduce the pressures on if like the hotspots as we become more aware that we can have meetings like this and this is a meaningful way to engage not the only way to engage not the way we want to live our whole lives but it is a way that you know we can all share ideas in a, in a useful way that will make it easier for the Grimsby's and the Sunderland's and the uh, great Yarmouth's of this world if you like to perhaps take a higher proportion of uh, of, of housing and place quality need um, uh, now what was interesting was um uh, we, you know, we encountered much startling evidence. This was my, I think, my favourite quote. I've subsequently uh, uh, discovered who was the developer who said it. I'm afraid it's broadly true. Uh, uh, we too often prioritise, if you like, the infrastructure and the technology, not the humans who will live in it. And that has, um, uh, I think, bad impacts on, on many humans. Uh, and interestingly, despite the controversy when it was set up, it actually quickly became clear, uh, above all perhaps from the many uh, I was going to say hundreds, I think it was hundreds, but certainly there are many, many dozens of, of you know, members of the public who got in touch with us. You can see some quotes in the bottom right of this slide, that this, I, this the desire for places to grow organically and not to feel done at um, uh, was quite profound. Uh, and we saw that also in polling, that Civic Voice and also the RTPI kindly did on our behalf. People wanted places to be beautiful, to be good, to be places that was uh, linked to, to, to good development. Um, we chose to define beauty broadly. Um, holistically, you might say at three scales, the building, the place and the placing in the landscape. It's not just a matter of how buildings look, that does include that, but also the wider spirit of place and our overall settlement patterns and how they, they interact uh, with nature. Uh, and we were the first to concede that, you know, we can and do create beautiful places today. Uh, his Goldsmith Street in, uh, uh, in Norwich, uh, Savoy Circus in London, uh, the Wintles in Shropshire, uh, the Bourne Estate in London, uh, Nansled and in, in, in Newquay in Cornwall. However, um, too often we don't. And the, the public we, we discovered see the planning process as a shield, they're not a sword. So aesthetic considerations are largely in the context of conservation. Um, it's become a backward looking concern. I really have any marginal interest when you're planning for the future. And if you doubt me, and I suspect many of you don't, I hope you don't, you know, put yourself in a, in a planning committee meeting or a, a board meeting of a development company. And the, the, the profound quality of the place that we create has just not been a primary issue for at least a generation. I think I'll give you rather more. Um, contractually, in order to use this image, I wasn't allowed to criticize it, so I shan't, but this is, um, uh, this is the uh, new air vent in London. I shall let it speak for itself. Um, so development can be the cause of ugliness, um, but it can also be the cure. Um, and as a society, we need to relearn how to change this most fundamental expectation. And the design and development industries need to need to earn it, I think. Now, underpinning much of the, um, the report were really three key insights. Uh, the first is that insanely perversely, we are not creating uh, places as good as we did centuries ago. And that isn't true of any other part of the market economy. Everything else is, is getting better. Um, the polling, the pricing, the focus group data, I, I won't go through that all uh, today, uh, you know, shows that we are consistently creating places that are actually less popular and often less valuable than many of our historic towns. Um, the report that was most timely when we published our, our commission was the, the CPRE in Place Alliance uh, report that was brought out, I think, just a week or so before, which showed that, slightly depending on how you cut the data, between two thirds and three quarters of places were, were not good, sustainable, happy making places. Uh, why is this? Um, well, I think one is technology. So you know, it's a toxic technology. We can now build huge, ugly sheds uh, such as this one, which is in a very prime location in London, uh, incredibly cheaply. I think secondly, we've got confused about the role of the motor car. And this isn't by the way, just in Britain, this is across the world. I think we actually, this one is being fixed now, I think. You know, motor cars are, it's easy, and too many architects and urbanists do this, it's easy to be very rude about cars. 
cars are great liberating things, and they've given to the broad mass of the population the same liberty of movement that only the rich had in 19th century. And one must never, never, never forget that. However, just because cars are great at giving individual movement within very big cities or between towns and places, it, it doesn't mean they need to sort of cut through um, every uh, every bit of our towns. And uh, you know, for three generations, we thought that was the case, and, and we were clearly wrong. And um, this is what making that confusion has done to our, 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 our land use planning. Um, increasing labour costs over the last century have also um, uh, made it harder to create uh, good places. So mapping selection effects on where people want to live uh, doesn't make pretty reading for people who are you know, proud of, of, of most 20th or early 20th century design or development. Um, the second insight that I think underpinned our report uh, is that at the pop, so I can't say what any of you individually like, and you'll be pleased to know I'm, I'm not going to, um, but at the population rather than at the individual level, the idea that design is entirely subjective is a very dangerous myth. And I'm afraid a myth that too many have made use of. Um, what people like, where they want to be, the relationship between place and health is increasingly predictable. Um, where we live has a measurable effect on our physical and mental health, on how much we walk and how many neighbours we know, on how tense we feel. Uh, design affects us from the air we breathe to our ultimate sense of purpose and well-being. Uh, the presence of such heterogeneous variables uh, as street trees, um, as clear block patterns, uh, some symmetry uh, in a facade, some colour, um, coherent complexity, um, uh, pl places that people uh, can easily associate uh, with texture and making safer and easier to walk are very consistently uh, linked to lower crime, better health and, and more support for development. And I think one of the themes which I think Susan mentioned earlier that, that we used as a pull this out was to make the case for gentle density uh, which optimizes the advantages of propinquity, and there are more likely to walk, more likely to know your neighbors, uh, but also personal space. And that is the most consistent finding in all the price elasticity surveys of, of uh, home values and place values is that people do want more space. That's not, uh, you know, they'll trade that off versus uh, location and versus other aspects of place quality. Um, uh, so just to cite a little bit of the of the research, and I won't I won't uh, do too much on this. And, and Susan, you probably know this uh, type of material very well. This is a famous study done by um, uh, Dr. Appleyard in the 1970s in the states, where he mapped friendship patterns across streets with different levels of traffic. You've all read it by now. Heavy traffic on the left, light traffic on the right, and you can see uh, the greater web of friendship patterns in a location. And, and you know, having friends in a local area, as long as we're in control of it, I don't feel we're forced to speak to people we don't wish to, is, is pretty consistently associated with higher well-being and, and place happiness and indeed happiness. Um, a more recent study, I think in, in Bristol uh, a few years ago, has replicated these findings, actually a slightly better controlled study. Um, I touched on trees earlier. Uh, there are no no-brainers in life. That's, that's always a little bit dangerous. But planting more street trees is as close as you will ever get to a no-brainer in terms of an increase for air quality, slower cars, people more likely to walk, people having better uh, mental and physical health. And you can argue, and there are legitimate arguments to have about causation versus correlation. Um, in a way, ultimately, it doesn't matter, um, though there clearly is some causation, but there's very strong correlation. So people are, are consistently choosing areas uh, with, with more street trees. I mentioned blocks earlier. Um, there's really fascinating research, for example, from Australia or from this country, associating clear block patterns with clear backs and fronts uh, with walking and with uh, lower crime and, and less fear of crime, because they feel like it's, it's, it's harder to get to the back of things. Um, there are some uh, tweaks on that data about citywide spatial patterns, but I can come back to that in questions if you like. Uh, and mixed use areas, again, as I'm sure most of you know, are associated with walking more, cleaner air and fewer and shorter car journeys. Um, the plea I always make and, and get into trouble with in some quarters, I hope I won't tonight, but, but feel free to get angry with me, is that facade quality of a building does really matter. It is not a superficial thing. It's not the only thing that matters, but it is one of the things that does. This is a lovely study done by Charles Montgomery of Happy City. Um, tourists posed as, uh, or sorry, other students posed as lost tourists in front of both these buildings in a similar location in the same city and waited for people randomly to stop and help them. Five times as many people helped, offered to help uh, the building on the left, as I see it, uh, versus on the right. And there's you know, uh, similar studies show, showing the same. If it's helpful, and this is on our website, we summarise some of this data in these eight key themes. Uh, I'm not saying these are the only or the best summary, but this is our attempt at it. Gentle density, little and often for greenery, structure benches and statues, beauty really matters, mix up the uses, edges attract and protect, human scale enclosure and walkability works. That's that's our sort of little summary. I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs>
Um, so that was the, uh, if you like, the, the, the second key insight was that this stuff matters. It is not just an issue of subjective personal choice. There is personal choice. Of course, we're not. We're not machines, but we are influenced by the places we live in. The third key insight, and, and in some ways, perhaps the one that some find most difficult, is that there has been some role for the state in the regulation of our towns and cities, I mean, I mean, literally forever. It is part of the irreducible core of what government does. Um, this is Monjaro, one of the uh, earliest <laughs> extant city remnants this is in the Indus Valley. Uh, there's very, we don't, you know, we don't have a full history of the place, you'll be delighted to know, but you know, there's really very clear evidence of some sort of guiding hand on the block structure in this and indeed in a, other ancient cities. And we do have much clearer evidence for some of the approach that above all the Roman Empire took. You know, this is this is something that cities and states do. Um, and the you know, the material and the form of uh, you know, British cities has been regulated for many centuries. Um, uh, and you know, so here's here, for example, is a, I think a second degree, a second order house uh, 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 from London after the, the Housing and Building Acts in the, in the late 18th century. Um, so, the, as we undertook our detailed analysis, time after time, however, we discover ways in which regulatory complexity and uncertainty, pl planning risk, uh, gaps in professional education, uh, public sector procurement was was leading to less good places. So, just to sort of come to a conclusion in a moment on my talk on the, the B4C Commission. These are the requests we made and the suggestions we made. And I've just realized, let me just get all those up now. Sorry, I shouldn't be there anymore. Um, oh, let's go back. Um, so these were the key themes. Um, and some of these have been picked up by the government subsequently. Some frankly haven't, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, the first, and I think the first of the, sort of the two ones I'll focus on in the next few minutes, is that we need to create a predictable level playing field. Um, and I think, yes, I've got it here. Um, the British, or perhaps I should say, the English planning system is quite a strange one. Um, so we have uh, less clear, less binding local plans, which is very material consideration choices, but doesn't actually set what can and can't be built than pretty much anywhere else. Ireland, in a way, Portugal, bits of the states are the same, but much of the states, and certainly most of Europe, uh, has a like a more certain, more regulated plan. And that really matters. I can't remember if I've got a slide on this now, I don't, but I'll, so I'll just, you just have to trust me. Um, if you look at the um, evidence on who builds homes and who creates places, we've got one of the most concentrated markets in the world. I think, we, I think it's fair to say, so in research I've seen, we have the most concentrated market in the world. We are far more reliant on a small number of large house builders and small developers. Now, I have no sort of profound criticism to make, they have every right to exist, um, but we make it much easier for them to dominate the market because we create very high levels of planning risk, which means you know, market entrance, self-build, custom build, which is tiny in this country compared to most of the world, just finds it far harder to compete because all of the money you spend, and many of you will know this, before you get planning permission is money at risk. If you don't get it, you've burnt the money. And that is an incredibly expensive capital to raise. And as we now start, you know, we're, we're now advising some uh, landowners and developers as well as community groups. And that is really, you know, become incredibly clear to me. You know, not unreasonably, developers want to spend as little money as they can pre-planning. I don't, I don't actually blame them for that. Um, uh, it's, it, it's what we are incentivizing them to do. So we need to you know, make it easier to find more clearly what we mean by good and by popular and by healthy. Not necessarily force people to do exactly that, but make that the easy thing to do, make that the natural thing to do. And that's not where we have got to at the moment. And that's why we made the case um, uh, for uh, uh, much clearer local plans, more visual, uh, more code based to, to allow landowners and developers and self builders and custom builders to see what would be particularly easy to get permission for. Um, this is actually a great street style. I just, I've just pulled in to make the point. I mean, certainly on the work we're doing on codes uh, and for any of you involved, I mean, I think our, our, our case would be increasingly confidently, uh, keep it short, keep it visual and be very clear that things are either obligatory, uh, strongly advised or just an idea uh, and be very clear what's in each place and be a key focus on materials heights and uh if you like um facade pattern those are things that really really set a place as well as actually the quality of the street and, uh, and the way the carriageway and the pavement interacts and just to make the point that it really is the pictures not the words that matter here is um, a toronto restaurant uh, that renamed their burgers so they could be expensed to your job uh, so as you can see you've got a mini dry raised whiteboard there and a, and a silicon keyboard cover uh, you know, what the, the reality is what it is not the words that are used to describe it and we time after time i suspect some of you uh, you know, have seen marvellous words in a, 
uh, you know, in a, in a um, design and access statement, uh, which I cannot link to the to the actual planning proposal. So this is why we've got to make the system more more visual. Um, just a word on uh, the uh, rightly controversial subject of uh, of permitted development. This is the famous uh, development in uh, Watford, not a million million miles away from you. Um, which uh, the planning inspector was unable to turn down, but I think reasonably described as not a positive living environment. Now, this is interesting. There's a tension here. Uh, actually, the concept of permitted development, I, some things that are just allowed to happen very easily, I think is fine. So I don't think the concept of PD is problematic. The problem is when you have no clear standards, which is clearly the case here. So the case we made in the report, and I'm pleased to see, I think the government is now starting to follow, uh, perhaps not as fast as some would like, um, is to... You know, keep the idea of PD, but just impose really clear and indeed high quality standards. Make it easy to do the right thing. This is not the right thing and, uh, and, and should, clearly should not be permissioned. Um, but you know, uh, in terms of minimum sizes, uh, window sizes, uh, and I hope some others to come, uh, in, that, 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 that must be the right approach. So that was our first theme. Second theme uh, was communities, and if you like the, the, the phrase you've kind of given me, bringing democracy forward. Um, these numbers are from memory, so forgive me if I get them wrong. Uh, I think 76% of people say they'd like to get more involved in planning. I think it's about 24% of people say they have ever in any way been involved in planning. About 3 or 4% of people are normally involved in the, uh, I don't know, I'm surprised it's that high, creation of a local plan. And most people see their involvement with planning as something that happens at the development control process point. That's not the case, for example, in America, where people are far more focused on their impact in, in the local zoning code, in, uh, in, in fact, the, the, the code that is set locally. We've got to fix that. And there's fantastic officials doing their best, um, but for a variety of reasons, we can come back to in the questions if, we, if people wish. You know, we, we have not succeeded in involving any meaningful number of local people meaningfully in creating a local plan. And by the way, I don't blame people because a local plan is such a long, obscure, difficult to understand policy written document that it is not something most people, not something I would normally choose to get involved with. Um, so we've got to move public engagement forward. Uh, wherever possible, uh, engage deep. This is a co-design process we were running um, uh, in, in Shadwell in East London, but also engage wide and make use of the revolution that is only just starting to happen on digital planning. So a combination of mapping tools, I should say we have one, but you know other, others are available. Do, do use our Create Communities tool, um, uh, but also visual preference surveys, comparing different you know, material or facade patterns or street treatments or heights or whatever it might be. Um, it's now, and, and this, these types of things work incredibly well on mobile phones. Increasingly, people, and particularly younger people, use mobile phones, not, not, not laptops, to, to access the internet. So the potential, and this, I think, links very strongly to your question to me about codes, the potential to involve a much wider number of people. What would you like new streets to look like? Would you like new street trees uh, in, in existing streets? Would you like to change your carriageway in this way? These questions can stop being verbal and can start being visual. Um, and to those, I'm afraid there are, I'm afraid some of them are architects, who say that this is a superficial to respond way to respond to places? I have to say I think that is baloney. Um, you know, our brains are largely visual. We respond to places visually, and I can assure you that an extended carriageway visualized uh, versus um, uh, drawn is far more comprehensible in the latter situation than the first. I will touch on a few other things I made. Though they're not quite as relevant to the subject you've given me. This I think is particularly important, though, and it's it's not one that the government has I think yet really picked up on. Um, Due to disconnects in the way the tax system works, as some of you may know, landowners are essentially incentivized to sell land quickly rather than stay involved for the long term. Uh, this is the opposite of how we, if you like, landowners used to develop land, and it's been an absolute disaster because it essentially encourages them to sell to the people who can pay most up front rather than take a long-term interest. Not all of them want to take a long-term interest, but some of them do, and many of them are genuinely concerned about the places they're creating, and particularly if they're going to stay involved in the local area. So we are we're disincentivizing the right thing. That's something that the Treasury needs to change and is hard to change. We've also proposed uh, creating a stewardship kite mark, perhaps owned by Homes England in conjunction with uh, you know, industry. That's, there are a few moves starting to happen on that, and that uh, some of the funds available should be in a patient capital fund rather than in a sort of quick funds to house builders. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll move on quickly. We also made a case which will be Minister for Place, Chief Placemaking and Local Authorities. I think that's going to happen. It was mentioned in the white paper. Um, and uh, the VAT tax uh, treatment of new build and uh, regeneration should be aligned. It's not. Um, we came up with a suite of specific policies on high streets and uh, encouraging the recycling and the reuse of buildings. 
Uh, and we're really trying to make the case of the importance, and many of you will know this, for embodied carbon as opposed to just uh, in use energy usage. Uh, this is a barn that is the best part of a thousand years old and has been you know, reused many times. It's now an art gallery. I don't think anyone is going to be recycling or reusing that in any, in any way. Um, and this stuff matters. Um, this uh, building was uh, repurposed into this, a bit denser, slightly more attractive, and um, uh, reusing most of the existing infrastructure. Ashes and size, uh, I know the lady who lives near this, who sort of campaigned for this to be better. And had it not been for her, uh, some would say, I wouldn't, you know, nimbyish input, um, uh, the thing would have been much, much, much worse than the rather lovely building that is now there. Uh, and we made a strong case against what I call boxland, uh, uh, which is a hard case. We can come back to that in the questions in favour of more walkable and more densely populated high streets and come back to shopping patterns post-COVID in a moment. Um, that's an example. Um, I'm going to, I think, move us on because otherwise I'll probably go on for too long. Um, there are quite a few um, things in building regs or in planning policy, often about back-to-back -back distance, certainly about minimum parking requirements, make it hard to create gentle density, actually less so in London, but certainly outside London, if you've got a two cars per home requirement, and I understand some of the pressures for that, but we've got to get to a situation where that becomes less necessary. Um, and then I think incredibly popular we're finding in uh, many of the workshops that we run, um, which we now do across the country, both online and hopefully about to start offline again. Um, Regreening our streets is a popular thing to do. It's a right thing to do. And I think it's right that the government and local government and those involved with that find easy ways to encapsulate that, to bring it to life and to make it happen. And there's a little bit of criticism when we, we published that you know, planting two million street trees sort of was a superficial thing to say. Well, maybe it's a superficial thing to say, but uh, as the evidence of street trees is so profoundly and clearly beneficial, actually to taking something like that and saying, this is something we as a society should do, you know, across existing and new places, I think is a, a necessary and usefully simplifying thing to say. Um, we're certainly encouraging as many house builders as we currently can to plant one fruit tree per house, which a couple, I think, are going to, to, to say yes to that. Um, I think I'll jump over education other than to say in the long term, this is crucial. And I, obviously, Susan's doing great work. I have to say, uh, Create Streets, we struggle to find good enough people to employ, uh, particularly those who've got architectural experience as well as urban design experience. Um, Practising urban designers and architects with a... Uh, genuine understanding of this type of evidence and with an ability to uh, create places and facades, if you like, that are part of the vernacular tradition, not, not constrained by it, but are part of it, is, is vanishingly small. So I think there's a real educational challenge. Forgive me, Susan, to you and your colleagues across the, the tertiary sector to do something uh, much better than we're currently doing. Uh, obviously, there are many exceptions to that, so please don't take that as a, as a universal statement. Um, the, the final key thing we said Perhaps, perhaps the least interesting to many, but I think absolutely important, is that the, there needs to be a shift in the way the planning system runs uh, from being, if you like, document-driven to being data-driven um, so that it becomes uh, easier to streamline some things, simple applications, uh, that uh, officials in I don't know, housing or regen or transport departments should be targeted on the happiness and well-being of people who live in their area, not just on clear engineering efficiency, that the review of Homes England, that the Homes England's remit needs to change to be including quality of place, uh, as well as just sheer numbers, that they should be taking a more master developer role, allowing others to come in within their framework, not just selling it off to the, to the highest bidder. And that, and this is something actually we're going to do more work on, that the process of public procurement of architecture in places, uh, I'm afraid just needs to become more clearly representative of civic pride and local preferences. And that there's a role for competitions that more clearly make use of what people like and what they want to see. And that too much of the public procurement over the last few generations has been shoddy, both in the quality of the build and the aspiration for the place that it creates. And we made a, a case, if you like, of moving from a vicious circle of parasitic development. It's not good. People oppose it. Therefore, uh, it, we have to force it through to one of virtuous circle of regenerative development. Very clear asks, removal of the unintended incentives for what we call the next field development model. That's the incentive to sell to the volume house builder. So that more people see development as net positive, as it can be, as it should be, 
more sense of agency and design and planning of new places, planning of new places because it's embedded in the local plan. And some degree of speculation is thus removed from land prices. It will never be all, and it shouldn't actually be all. You know, there's a role for speculation, there's a role for competition. That's absolutely right. There should just be a clearer framework uh, that, that 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 works in. I'll jump over that. Um, we launched a bit over a year ago, and I think importantly for the conversation we're about to have. Actually, despite all the controversy when we started, got a very warm response, uh, kindly from the government, uh, also from architects who I think had been expecting to disagree with it. This is Annie Riches, who who, who uh, co-won the the Goldsmith Prize for the sorry the uh, Sterling Prize. Uh, for, you can see the, the monetary link there uh, for the Goldsmith for her <laughs> Goldsmith Street uh, a year ago. Uh, David Rudlin, the outgoing chair of the Academy of Urbanism, was very supportive. As slightly to my surprise was the TCPA. Uh, uh, UMB Alliance, very much not on the same page as the TCPA, uh, and, and other public philosophers uh, such as Alain de Botton. And I, and I should just say for the record, because I don't think I've mentioned him, that my co-chair was the late Roger Scruton, uh, who did, obviously did huge amounts of the work on the report. Um, that's it on that. I'm not going to go through the rest in, in, in the same detail you'll be re- re- relieved to know. There was then obviously a, um, a slight pause. In August of last year, the government came out with its planning white paper, uh, which was criticised in some areas. Um, I think there's very good stuff in there. I wouldn't quite agree with all of it, but there is very, I think, important stuff there on creating more certainty in the planning system and allowing it to be easier to create the right places and a very rightly strong emphasis on um, a greater role for beauty at the highest level of planning. Um, and then in January of, of uh, I think it's it's here, yeah, in January of this year, the government finally, it's like delay, uh, published their response to living with beauty and uh, suggested changes to the national planning policy framework, the so-called NPPF, which is the, as I'm sure most of you know, is a document that sits under uh, statute setting the framework for planning in England. And it you know, didn't quite do exactly the wording we wanted, but it certainly followed up a high proportion of the suggestions we had made to make beauty in place, making a strategic policy to embed it there at the highest level, um, make it easier to refuse places on reasons of poor design, um, asking local, encouraging local authorities to put in place their own design codes, asking for streets to be tree-lined, and critically, I think, improving by well, requiring biodiversity net gain. And the really, I think, positive thing is I can, I can say with complete confidence, you know, we are seeing that starting to have a change. Although it's actually not formally in the MPPF, it's, I think it will shortly be. It's, it's only consulted on, but in some of the conversations we've been having, and I know others have been having with landowners, with developers, including you know some of the developers you wouldn't normally expect to worry about this stuff, but <laughs> certainly haven't worried about this stuff. Um, uh, and with some of the, the the land promoters, they're the people, if you like, who game the complexity of the current system. They're experts in getting planning permission. Again, I don't blame them for existing. They're responding to the situation. But they, you know, by the nature of what they do, they're the people who, if you like, they find the value and often take out the, the, the real place quality because they, 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 they work to what will get planning permission, which I'm afraid too often is not a good enough place. Um, but some of them are now genuinely starting to think about this agenda and of asking us and others to advise them on that. So I think it is uh, moving in the right direction. That doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet. We're certainly not. Also, at the same time, the government published its National Model Design Code, which was uh, led by David Rudlin uh, of, uh, uh, of, what's he on? of, um, I can't remember the name of the firm now. Um, um, anyway, then, oh, oh, that's it, uh, which is a very good document. If you haven't looked at it, I do recommend it. It's not actually a National Model Design Code. There, sh- there shouldn't be a top down design code. It's a process for creating a code and suggestions for what should be in it. It's necessarily quite a long document. Um, because if you like, it's trying to give advice for all, uh, all all possible situations. And I think the trick for local councils and if you offer a place, of which more in a moment, will be to help different parish councils, neighbourhood groups, local councils, you know, if you like, find the right path through it for them to clearly set a good framework for popular local development that would encourage right development to make it harder to do the wrong stuff. Um, it's a good visual document. It's got lots in urban form on closure ratios, on facade quality, all things that English planning has not really talked about, arguably ever, certainly for, for, for a generation other than in conservation areas. Um, I've been asked, as, as Susan kindly mentioned, I should say, I'm not speaking in this capacity tonight, because uh, otherwise I have to check everything I say, um, uh, to, to create a new office, new office place uh, as a um, initially as part of the Ministry for Housing, and then hopefully latterly next year being sort of spun out as a new entity. I'm chairing the transition board for that and working with Joanna Averley and uh, officials from the Ministry of Housing. Uh, yeah, more on that shortly, I hope. Um, but yeah, in a nutshell, it's to help make everything we've been talking about happen. I think I can, I think I can say that. 14 pilots have already been announced uh, with more to come later in the year. 
and the transition board are helping support and indeed officials are helping support that. Um, I think that shouldn't say uh, a couple, couple, couple more quick things. Uh, some of you will know about Manual for Streets, a very good document from, uh, well, gosh, nearly 15 years ago now. Uh, that's now being updated. There was, a, there was a refresh a few years later. Manual for Streets 3 is now being worked on by the Department of Transport. And I hope well, it's going to bring what's been done uh, before. The key battle, and this sets out good principles for, play, for streets as places as opposed to just sort of highways. Um, the hope is to get some of that into policy, not guidance. And whether that will happen or not, I think we don't yet know. But I think it will still help um, county councils and highways authorities increase their focus on streets as places, not just uh, not just traffic. Uh, and we're seeing that again already in some of the work we're doing. Um, and also, though this hasn't been much commented on, oddly, it was announced perhaps because it was announced last summer at some height of COVID, and it's sort of got a bit lost in the in the subsequent weeds. Active Travel England, uh, if you haven't heard about it here first, you've heard it here first. Uh, the government has committed to creating this, and we at the Office for Place are engaging with them to really uh, focus on increasing the amount of walking and cycling and other uh, non, non, uh, non, non-car based ways of getting around and between uh, towns and cities and villages. Um, and they've got a big budget as well. Uh, two billion, I think, is the figure that has been made public. Um, that's it. I'll stop there. I'm sorry, that's gone on for far too long. I hope that wasn't too, uh, too tedious. Um, it, yeah, most of you are still here, I think. So... Um, I've not been looking at any of the questions that have come in, so I'll shut up now, Susan, and let you um, let you compare. I hope that was okay. Um, Nicholas, that was absolutely marvellous. I've been frantically taking down notes um, because, it, you know, you always expect a few bon mots, but you've bas- it's been basically, you know, one kind of extremely useful point after another. So I'm not sure if my my, um, my note-taking has kept up. But- well, what, while I've been talking, my children have brought me some Watsits. <laughs> so I'm going to eat a Watsit now. I hope that's okay. I haven't been I- bought cheesy Watsits, so I've, I've, uh, which is a bit sad, but um, I, I won't begrudge you yours. Thank you. Um, well, there's been really a lot of really um, interesting points and questions raised in the chat, but I did want to give the kind of first go at this to Vanessa, if if that's possible, um, and then I and then I'll go through the the, the questions in the chat and, and get you to respond to those. So, Vanessa, perhaps if you had something you sort of a burning question you did want to put to to Nicholas before I would open up to the floor, that would be terrific. Well, th- thank you, and uh, you know, thank you. Uh, reiterating from earlier on, is thank you, Nicholas, for sparing the time and, and Susan for this collaboration to, this evening. It's, it's really wonderful because you've both been great friends to Lips and Albans uh, going back to 2014, just after we became a constituted group. And um, it has been hard going, but we persevered. And we do have Oak Tree Gardens in St Albans, which is uh, the outcome of our first design charrette, which you know, we were nationally recognised for, as well as the city centre opportunity site master plan, which sadly didn't go anywhere. But that's another story. But you really emphasise uh, some key points that I've been just checking up on before we came on this evening. Now, it was something about um, I actually spoke to the uh, um, at an overview and scrutiny committee at the council about this, and it was saying that. You found, I found in your report that only 2% of people trust developers and only seven trust their local authorities on large developments. And uh, I think Lux and Albans really wants to try and assist in um, breaking down this, these perceptions and helping both developers and our local planning authority. And that's why we're very pleased that we have um, councillors on our representatives group, um, although they don't represent people, our representatives group, we're there to deal with the day to day functioning. But we also have a um, local authority spatial planning officer. And so we liaise with, with her at the moment. Um, and it's, it's to help um, us work in a collaborative and uh, consensual way to, so that, that people do have a chance to actually say what they feel about um, developments, but also the design code stage, which we've already started on. Um, And they do have strong views, but they don't believe they're going to be listened to as those figures um, actually exemplified for me. Um, 
But there was just one quote from our first uh, charrette when we worked with the Prince's Foundation back in 2012 was, I realized this was indeed going to be a community-based and cooperative exercise and our combined knowledge had real value. And that is something I think has been missing. Um, and I know a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk about um, councillors having their say and um, the community having their say at a planning application stage. But I struggle sometimes to think of how many times that I've made a, a personal um, representation at the planning stage has actually made any difference. Whereas I think if we do work with design codes and we it is genuine community involvement, I think that really is a, a, a fundamental issue that I really think we, we could uh, achieve an awful lot with. So that's my sort of, I don't go on any longer. <laughs> Do you want to respond, Nicholas, before I start telling you about some of the questions in the chat? Thank yes, you, I, I, Vanessa. I, I think you've come to the heart of things, actually, there. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the 2% the and the 7% figure. And, yeah, by the way, I think it's a bit unfair to both local planning authorities and uh, developers. I'm often their hardish critic. Um, but I think more than 2% of them and more than 7% of them deserve trust. But but uh, but I, that is the figure. Um, yeah, the current system, which is putting the emphasis, it says it's plan-led, it's not. It's development control-led. And the development control is not working. So, you know, to those, and I'm afraid there are some, a little bit naively, I think, defending the current situation, it isn't working. It is not delivering enough homes, and it is not delivering homes that are good places, enough homes, I should say, it does deliver some, that are good places to live in a sustainable development pattern. And too many people up and down the country, Vanessa, have your experience of trying to make it better, and I can't. So, Having a development control process that is actually hard to influence is, if you like, the worst of all possible worlds. So um, let's make it, uh, and this is the bit which some people will find uncomfortable, and I suspect some people on the call may not like, so I apologise in advance. Let's make it easier to con genuinely uh, influence that local plan. But then let's accept there is some trade-off for that, because if we're going to be a bit more directive about what good means, and that's got to work, because if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work, um, Things that meet those standards will need to be easier for people to build. Um, so there is, a, you know, there is a trade-off on that. By the way, that is how most of the rest of the world works. And they tend to, you know, with some exceptions, build more homes. And I think in many cases, though, certainly not all, build create slightly better places. So you know, there are unavoidable tensions in this. Anyone who says, I am not saying, uh, you know, here's one big simple problem and I've got one big simple answer. I mean, certainly what I was trying to set out earlier was not one big simple answer. It's a range of things. Um, but there have to be trade-offs, if you like, where the power is and critically when the power is exercised and by whom. Again, I could, I could go on, but uh, I think your point went to the heart of it, Vanessa, as Susan says. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, so our first question was from Brian, and, and actually I think you did to an extent cover this, Nicholas, but Brian asks, how is beauty defined um, given that it is a subjective word and is, quote, in the eye of the beholder? That, th thank you, Brian, for asking that. So that is a very important question. Um, you will have heard me partly touch on it. Um, I think the point is this, um, beauty, and this is now in the MPPF, it will be shortly, um, beauty, if you like, should be our existential aim, a way of pulling together a holistic understanding of the type of places we wish to create for the lives that we lead, um, which is why we try to define it as ecumenically and broadly as possible. And the, um, I should say, actually, by the way, when the planning system was first being created in the, the modern planning system in the 1930s, because there was legislation pre-war as well as the 40, famous 47 Act, we weren't afraid to talk about beauty as our existential aim. If you look at the work of Octavia Hill, if you look at some of the people criticising ribbon development in the 1920s and 30s, if you look at the preamble to the 1935 Act, beauty is there as a name. But over the last three generations, we have sort of lost confidence in that as our intent. We've dropped it and we have forgotten to pick it up. So it should just be there as what we collectively as a society are trying to achieve. But then in defining it, um, I mean, I, I could make a, I'll come back to the statistics in a moment, but in defining it, um, it is not my job. It's certainly not the job of Robert Jenrick. It's not the job of anyone in national government to say what is right for St. Albans or right for Hertfordshire or right for wherever it might be. Um, that is you know, our job, your job, other people's jobs collectively who live in that area. Some of that will be expressed by who they vote for in local council elections. That will actually in a way be the key moment because I think we should get to a point where it is clearer 
what different colours will mean in terms of what happens and where and what it will look like and how it will behave. That's a legitimate, very legitimate thing for local democracy to involve. And then in the subsequent creation of the local plan, and so we talked about this just now, um, that the way it's done and what is in there doesn't define beauty top down, but defines the components bottom up, how wide the streets are, whether you use brick or wood, how high the buildings are, how frequent and compulsory street trees are, or what other elements you choose to prioritise. So like the bottom up bit is objective, well, at any rate, is specific, I should say, but that is the aim uh, that is underpinning us. So it's, it, it, I'm not a lawyer, it, it should be, it, it's clearly not going to be a very constructive, I and mean, quite fun to watch, but it wouldn't, I think, be very constructive to have Q, two QCs arguing over a new, a new persimmon development as to whether it is or isn't beautiful. I don't think that is likely to be a constructive legal conversation to have. However, it's very easy got legal conversation to have, well, here in, you know, wherever, we have got these requirements for building materials and for back-to-back -back distance and for this and for that, and you're not meeting it, and that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. That's a very easy legal comment to have. So, so I think that's the, the tension. And then just one final point, and I'm slightly repeating myself, but I think it's so important. Um, the data, the visual preference surveys, the wealth and the health and the well-being surveys and, and, and indeed revealed preferences and pricing information is actually pretty consistent about the sort of places that most people want to live in. It's not absolute. Um, we've done loads of surveys. I mean, others in the States. And what's light, nice about this is actually it's, it, particularly in a divided society like America, it's actually something that isn't that divisive. So certainly in the surveys we've done, you know, um, whether you're rich or poor, left or right, man or woman, you know, up or down, uh, actually we mainly agree with each other. It's sort of slightly depending on what question you ask and how you ask it. It's sort of between about 70 and 90%. It was a, probably one of the most robust surveys done on this recently was on uh, federal buildings in the States. I, I don't think there are many surveys you could run in the States where Democrats and Republicans agree. And they did. And that, that must be a good thing. At least I think it's a good thing. And, you know, we create streets. We work with Tory councils. We work with Labour councils. We have worked, well, not right now, we have worked with Lib Dem councils. And I don't actually find dramatically different tensions in those. I mean, there's slightly different pressures, but I don't think they're dramatically different. And increasingly, I think, generationally, as the importance of sustainability rightly increases, I, have to say, I think the conversations we have with you know, young Conservative councillors and young Labour councillors are so there are differences, but in their fundamentals, I, I'm reassured by how similar they are. Like, I hope that's helpful, Brian, and thank you for the question. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, Robert's making the comment here that planning officers, at least in St Albans, do not consider beauty in any form. And then in the kind of follow-up says, how do we get traffic out of St Albans? Uh, no possible inner ring road, question mark. So um, we're going to a very place-specific point I'm, there. I, I, I'm nervous about telling you about traffic in St Albans because <laughs> I, I just don't know. So okay. I think I might... Um, I might dodge that one if I might. Sorry. I, uh, Perhaps Vanessa, you wanted to might, nip in might, here. Yes, just might come in a, a little bit. What was the, the, remind me the, the first part of the question? I'm not trying to dodge the second. It was part. about whether the planning officers in Robert's estimation oh, were not really right. considering yeah. beauty in any sense or I, in I any form. Talk, I can talk to that one in principle, but the second one I'd rather <laughs> dodge if that's okay. Sorry. <laughs> if I'm, if I may get, get on on that Please, one first. It, uh, the um, I think development control as it used to be development management have an extremely difficult task and it was said to me um, a number of years ago when um, not in St Albans I might add that uh, when discussing uh, about planning applications with development management ask them is that policy or is that personal opinion now it that that gets to me to the crux of, of, of a problem um, I, I have to put my hand up that I did work in, in um, a local planning authority uh, planning office <laughs> many years ago. And it is a very difficult job for them uh, in, in development control. And I think the clarity um, that uh, design codes would bring, it, they either, you know, an application either complies or it doesn't, obviously training and expense and expertise and that needs to be brought in. But I think that would help them um, an awful lot. And it would certainly um, give me reassurance that if design codes, which the community had been integral in, in, in help shape, um, that was informing the decisions that were being made, um, then, then I think that would be um, terrific. I think a, a definite move forward. Um, on to the traffic in St Albans, there is a consultation going on with the County Council 
and I don't think I'd better get involved in that. <laughs> Perhaps we ought not to go down that particular rabbit hole tonight, Vanessa, but maybe for another for another seminar. Um, but thank you for that. Um, Nicholas, you were going to perhaps come back on the planning and, and beauty interaction or lack of it. Well, j j just on the first one, um, uh, you know, again, perhaps slightly repeating what I said to Brian, but um, it, it won't be possible, given the new MPPF, to say this is irrelevant mm. because it is. it will be, it is it's about to be, enshrined in uh, what it is that planners are trying to do. They're not just trying to create sustainable places, nothing wrong with that. They're trying to create beautiful places. That is, object, uh, uh, you know, if you like, existentially what they are trying to do. So, you know, they can ignore it, but I don't think it'll get them very far. Uh, it'll, they'll, it'll have to have it in there sort of at the back of their minds. These places have to be popular and livable and lovable and homely, if, if that's what they're chosen to be. Um, and, uh, you know, as the pressure on design codes, certainly even in the current system, potentially if we go to a system post legislation, but even on the status quo, they're just going to have to start thinking about these things and it won't be possible. Well, no, that's going too far. It'll be harder uh, for uh, volume house builders just to completely ignore this stuff. It will still be possible, I think, because they've got very good lawyers, um, but it will get harder. And the, the number that are starting to genuinely think about this, uh, I think, gives some cause for hope. But as I, said, I don't want to be naive. There's, there's going to be many uh, travails and really bad schemes in front of us as well. Um, so thank you for that, um, Nicholas. Linda's asking an interesting one. Uh, Nicholas, what is your view of how we influence the soundscape as well as the visual look of the built environment? Oh, that's such a good question, Linda. Um, there's a chap in my team, Robert Kwalek, uh, who I wish was now on the call because he would give such a better answer than I will. Um, uh, this was something I, I'd, be, I'd be absolutely the first to confess. I, I hadn't thought about much until a few years ago, until Robert in, in the Crate Streets team uh, started uh, focusing my mind on it. Um, and uh, he has forced me to uh, look at uh, surveys and a few studies, which does show, as, as I suspect you know, if you're asking the question, uh, the degree to which uh, incoherent, unexpected, loud, unpleasant noise can create stress and cause all sorts of tensions. And though the research seems to be less good, you probably know more about it than I do, um, uh, you know, guess what? Poorer communities tend to suffer from it more than richer communities. What a surprise. Um, perhaps we should have actually had policies on sound in B4C. Actually, now, now I rather wish that we had, actually. Um, hopefully, quite a lot of um, what we're talking about will follow that, because clearly traffic is a key provider of that. My pet hate is, is uh, sirens, which I don't think need to be as loud or as objective. And I'm very happy to go back to 1960s Paris with a little more sort of gentle bee bar, bee bar. Um, clearly mixed use areas are associated or likely to be associated with more noise and certainly more noise at sort of like non-normal non types of day. Um, the problem at the moment is because we don't have enough places to live in and enough good places to live in, it tends to be poor people that ends up in those places as opposed to people who choose that. You know, there are, you know, we all, we're all different. We all have times in our life at which certain decisions are different. So, you know, age 22, we may make a different decision to when we've got young children or when we're older or whatever it might be. So part of the answer is having more places and hopefully some of the pressure coming off London, fingers crossed, uh, will do that. But, but I think um, above all making it easier to get very high levels of traffic out of neighborhoods i think is the ultimate answer to that as opposed in addition to uh, mucking around with uh, bee bars uh, that's not a very expert answer because it's not my area of expertise and as i say linda thank you for your question I, I wish robert was on the call because he he would cite numbers on that more confidently than i can i hope that's some help you're doing fine there actually although uh, thinking again we could be getting into ltn territory and other very interesting area for us for further discussion. So another one, here's from Jed. Jed's saying, Nicholas uh, does not mention the increased increasing role of neighbourhood plans, which are to survive the government's planning changes. Any views? I'm sorry for not. Did I not? I apologise. That was that was stupid of me. I don't know why I didn't do that. Sorry. I was... Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I guess two, two things. Uh, one, we're big fans of neighbourhood plans, uh, probably for the reasons that have been obvious in my talk, which is that... Um, you know, we, we like people expressing a confident and clear view on, on how development should be. Uh, that said, I don't think they're perfect. Uh, I think they're getting a little better. Um, they're somewhat set up to be complex and I think in some cases overly professionalised. Uh, and I mean, I've read too many of them. I think about half are probably not very helpful. Oh, no, let me rephrase that. I don't actually do much. And they're not, I, mean, that, um, I think about half are great. Uh, but you know, unless you're into allocating sites and setting codes 
it's very, very easy to ignore them. And indeed, that does happen. And I've certainly seen plans which I don't really think. In fact, the very first plan that I was involved with, um, which was one in London, you know, proceeded to not be able to influence quite a major development at the heart of their neighbourhood area. Um, because actually they'd been advised incorrectly, I think, uh, by their local borough, you know, not to say much on design other than very vague statements. So the consequence was when someone came along and proposed an absolutely appalling building in the middle of their main street, they weren't able to stop it, even though it was clearly against the intent, because, you know, it was back in that space of lawyers being able to argue whatever the hell they like, because it's just a few words. Um, so pro neighbor planning, uh, set codes, allocate sites. That then leads to the question of what type of site allocation might be possible post uh, planning reform if it happens in the way that's set out in the white paper. I would argue there should still be a case, as there is now, for allocating new sites. It is already the case that you can't, if you like, take out stuff that's there from top down. Um, I don't think that should change. Uh, but you know, being able to add new sites and being really clear and confident about what type of nature development should be, and indeed perhaps points about biodiversity and nature, I think, you know, should survive. And um, I would hope, this might be a pipe dream, if more processes are happening, even when there aren't neighbour planning formally, to set local codes, if you like, that will help bring into being uh, perhaps a, a richer and a wider infrastructure of groups of people who are you know, used to organising and influencing this. And maybe if they get more visual, it will get less, and forgive me, it'll get less Zoom conversation on you know, a Tuesday evening you know, and a bit more uh, you know, two minutes engagement one of, with one of these. And both are necessary. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not dismissing either. I hope that's helpful but i'm sorry for not mentioning neighbor planning jed i should have done thanks nicholas um not so much a question but um vanessa had put into the chat that fruit trees are in our um, draft design codes and i'd said excellent i'm obviously very interested in that as a food in place uh, researcher so that's you know great to see that you're talking but, about but that. it's got it's got a double if i may it's got a double impact mm. one it's the right thing to do mm. but two it's something that people who are you know a little bit less interested in this than i suspect all of you are can latch onto, and in my experience, instinctively like, because it, it speaks to us. It, it says something right mm. about the types of place most of us would like to live in. So it's actually got an important practical symbolic value as well as just being the right thing to do. Yeah, if, I, if I may just butt in there, the, there was only a problem with the, the fruit trees is when you, I mentioned it to a few councillors, they said, ah, oh, but the people slipping on the fruit and we'd have all the insurance claims. So it's, we, we do have a little bit of tension on that, on, on that one. So I think that might drop up in other places. It's, um, you know, in my view, uh, it's just part of life. And if you have a garden or if you mm. grow fruit, then, well, you know, you what? just watch what you're doing. <laughs> Uh, yes, thanks, Vanessa. I think this this notion of edible city solutions that's being sort of formalised into nature based solutions is is becoming more prevalent. And I think uh, it's wonderful to see that uh, Nicholas is uh, reinforcing that, it, despite people's anxiety about fruit slippage. Um, <laughs> I might move on to the next. Yeah, there, there are question. things that scare me yeah. more. I have to say, yeah. isn't that? Yeah. But, uh, but, no, it's a it's a legitimate yeah. point, but I think yeah. one can give too much yeah. credence to that. So uh, this next um, question from, from Brian actually, in a way, is an extension to the one that you've just answered, actually. To what extent, um, if there, if any, are the proposed design codes going to enable local communities to input to the style, et cetera, of developments in their community? If they can do so, how is that best achieved? So I don't think style, and forgive me, Brian, I don't think style is a very helpful word. Um, so, you know, I, a design code is not going to say, at least it shouldn't, this should be in a modernist style or this should be in a uh, you know, Georgian style or whatever, style, or indeed a you know, St Albans style. I mean, again, because that just gets you straight back into uh, territory that you can you know, essentially just you know, give it to the lawyers and let them have fun uh, at our expense. Um, and by the way, I should say, you know, it, it should be up to individual communities as to what they do or don't wish to code for. So if you don't actually care, and some communities may decide they don't, you know, don't say anything. Let it all happen. That's sort of where we are at the moment. Um, so you know, there should be no mandate. It shouldn't be obligatory to have a code or anyway, not a code that goes into any detail if you don't wish to. Um, if, if it's really important to you, and we're doing some work, for example, in a, in a, um, uh, in a I better not say which, because it's not public yet, but in a valley in Yorkshire, uh, where we've just been using our mapping tool to work out or to ask people who live in this valley, which are their favourite bits of towns and villages in that valley? Uh, and then we're looking at those places and we've been doing some analysis of that. Now, this is, uh, guess what? In Yorkshire, it's got lots of Yorkstone. That is the native material. Um, I like red brick. Red brick is a nice thing to use it where you live or where I live or other places. Uh, some of the least popular places in this bit of Yorkshire 
I've got red brick in it because it's clearly a silly thing to have in that bit of Yorkshire. Um, so I think the, the types of thing to answer, Brian, your question, you should be, if you wish to, not my call, it's your call whether you wish to or not, that you should be setting, are things such as materials, are things such as height to width ratio of streets or squares or, 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 or um, the inside of blocks, are the facade pattern, to what degree it's symmetrical, it's not, perhaps basics of window shape, and possible sort of key elements of detailing ornament if you wish to have that. So think in those terms, and remember you shouldn't be, sorry, this it's not that you're forbidding other stuff you're just making it easier to do some things to decide the things that you think are important and my, my two pennies worth would be that materials and facade pattern and that height to width ratio those are the things that most define a place and in my view that, that that might be one you might disagree with and think in those terms rather than it should be this style or that style but if a community and actually uh, we're, we're just kicking off work on the design code uh uh, for a parish in, I think it's in Sussex, you know, I think they're going to be quite, you know, it's a parish that's under, because it's quite close to London, it's under quite a lot of potential development pressure, it's just outside the Greenbelt. Um, you know, I think they're going to be quite clear that they not just want things that feel very English vernacular, that fit in, but also, and they're quite right to focus on this, because it's something that normally goes wrong, that it can't just be sort of you know, a sweeping cul-de-sac with sort of 15 parking places, then a few detached homes at the end, that the actual urban form and morphology has to be something that, even if it's not identical to the existing village centre, because it probably can't quite be that, it nevertheless can rhyme with it. Um, so they're going to be, I think, quite strict about that. I can imagine other communities where they, they'd be less so. I hope that is a helpful question. That's all I've got. Um, thank you, Robert. Uh, uh, thank you, Nicholas. Sorry, I'm just looking at someone called Robert who's asked and made a comment, which I'm getting myself confused. But Robert has made um, a comment, which is really an implied question, I guess, Nicholas. It's all very well for the government to encourage um, uh, BBBB, um, but building better, building beautiful. Um, but they're disenabling planning control in favour of permitted development. And I know you did mention permitted development earlier. Perhaps you'd like to come back on that one. Yeah, I know. I mean, this is obviously a, a very live issue um and i think there's a i mean what is permitted development for some of it was obviously for homes in yeah. office to residential conversion and the other main type i mean the other one that's controversial is uh for retail to residential conversion actually there's lots of other types of permitted development which don't get discussed as much because they're not as controversial so for example you know all of our rights if we live in certain types of detached or semi-detached homes to extend our house backwards you know within certain volumetric uh measures is pd and pd exists permitted development pd exists because under the 1947 in fact something under the 1935 uh, housing and planning act the plan to um, you know, the right to develop has been essentially nationalised. So permitted development is a statutory exemption to that. So the concept that there should be some things that by, the, by their definition don't require the states to say you can do it, I think is unarguably, I mean, it's obviously sensible in the sense that otherwise it would just be ridiculous. So I think if we can find ways to extend that, and here's the, here's the key point, you know, with very clear quality control, so we're just regulating the built environment, not micromanaging it, we're allowing, making the distinction. Clearly, there'll be areas where we should do individual high development control officer engagement, case by case involvement. You know, big developments, unique, weird, funny, strange, challenging. These should all be things that take you know this 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 stuff. But as much as possible, if we can push the good ordinary into being dealt with as good ordinary rather than as something that needs a huge amount of human time. Um, now, uh, to answer your question, Robert. Um, uh, so should you know? And we have, I think, the latest number I saw. Though it's probably gone up since I saw it. I think last time I looked, um, just over seventeen percent of shops uh, were vacant. The current system, I mean, and that is absurd and outrageous. If you don't mind me saying, the current system is not managing to make it easy to transfer those things into something that people want to use. So them sitting vacant is a is not just you know. Yes, it may be an abnegation, it may be a, a criticism of the landowners. Above all, it's a criticism, actually, of the system that makes it hard for them to convert them into offices or to healthcare centres or into homes. Given that in the southeast, you know, we're short of a few million homes, I think it's, it's doubly obscene. So we've got to find a way to systemically move, you know, allow uses to move into things that actually people want to use them for. There's a very strong case to going back. This isn't new. This is this is going back in time, going back to more people living in town centres on high streets and in, and in, and in urban centres. That's how we used to live. And where places have place value, people do want to live in the middle. It's the places where they don't that they wish to deny it, because you, you know places are great if they've got if they've got place value. Um, so I think where the government policy needs to improve, and here I'll agree with you, Robert, is there should be really clear standards, and this is now starting to happen, 
about um, uh, you know what's necessary internally, you know, just clear bait building regs, and also what can happen externally. Um, I don't think at the moment we've quite got that balance right. At the moment, you're not allowed to make changes. I think arguably you should be making the shop better or the shop facade better if you're turning it to a home or into an office. Um, so I think the concept is, I think, is not problematic. Uh, and we said this in the B4C report. If you're doing it without clear standards, then clearly, if you like, you're, you're deregulating, well, you're, 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 you're dismantling one system, but you're not mantling, to get my language wrong, something in its place. So um, a PD, I think, is very defensible as long as it's got clear standards. I hope that's helpful and not too provocative. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, Claire's noting, um, I work for Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation, where we frequently receive requests to change planted frontages to parking. Please can Nicholas recommend any good examples of accommodating parking within uh, planted frontages or convincing cases for retaining greenery? Thank you so much. Gosh, well, these are all really great questions. Thank you, everyone. And, and thank you, Claire, for that. That's, that's a tricky one. And whereas I could probably slightly sidestep the, um, uh, the one on St Albans traffic patterns, that's a harder one to sidestep, and I won't, or at least I'll try not to. Um, I mean, I think there's one general point to make and then a specific point on the design point. Um, you know, this tension between cars versus place is, is obviously profound. Um, and, you know, it's too easy, and I'm afraid I see this too often with, with some, to criticise people for wanting cars. Of course they want cars, and particularly if they've got, you know, two people working and you've got to take the kids to school, and if you're living in quite a lot of the country, you just don't have usable public transport. Maybe there should be more to use to use bikes, but if, they don't, if those roads don't feel safe, and frankly, they often don't, I'm not going to criticise people for sort of feeling that need to use cars. So, so first point one, I think, you know, in reality, I have to accept the world we're in, even though we'd like to change it. My dog is going bonkers over there, but let's just hope he, he's distracting me. I hope he won't distract you. It's Harry, stop it. My dog's called Harry. And there was a call the other day where he started sort of jumping up and trying to sort of lick me. And I said, Harry down. And I forgot that the person I was speaking to was called Harry. So I then had to apologize <laughs> profusely. But anyway, none of you are called, well, maybe some of you are called Harry. Um, and he stopped now. Um, so uh, when it comes to existing urban form, it can be quite hard, particularly if you're in detached, if you're in semi-detached or terrace territory, because if you're talking two or more cars per, per home, it then gets very hard to fit it in. Um, clearly, when you're de designing new places, and this you see done brilliantly at Nans Led in uh, Newquay or a couple of other places, you can put in, if they're well designed, it works, internal parking courtyards. I think Matthew Hardy is on the call. He knows far more about this than I do, um, you know, which have got views overlooking them. So it is doable and fixable in new developments. It can be genuinely very hard to retrofit in older developments. Ultimately, the answer is make the public transport and the cycling safe enough to make that work. I realise you can't necessarily wave your wand and do that. So to finally answer your question, um, we, uh, when we're working on schemes where we're putting in more parking than we wish to, uh, but nevertheless are compelled for one reason or another, um, we try and make a distinction in our minds between the um, car that goes by the property and then that additional car. We try and get it down. We, we try and get it down from 2 to 1.6, 1.5. We find it much easier to design at that level than at 2. And we try and make that second car non you know, not on the site and this is the key and then we use those grass blocks where you've got a bit of um concrete or cement but you allow the grass to grow within it and i think my answer to your question is and actually i i'll try and if if um susan or vanessa can send me your email claire i can't i won't be able to do it live we've actually done a little bit of design on this for some social housing in rochdale essentially use those grass box blocks you know put some hedge or some green on either side the bins are obviously the other problem when it comes to uh housing put the bins inside a mixture of brick with possibly some trellis for greenery on top. And it's not perfect, but you can get to something that I don't think ruins the facade pattern whilst allowing uh, that car to be parked. Um, so if Claire, if you via Susan or Vanessa can send me an email, I will try and dig out that picture and, and send it to you. I'll, I'll follow up I on finally that. answered your question. Yeah. Took me a long time to get there, though. I'll, I'll follow up on that one. And can I just say that um, Debbie's uh, made a comment after uh, Claire's question, which actually picks up on a number of points you've made, Nicholas. Um, Debbie, I'll just read it to you. Having enough parking is a significant priority for our communities, um, parish council and members. We find that insufficient parking is the, is the highly contentious and can have a significant negative impact on community cohesion. Our area is comprised of a mix of rural villages and market towns. Hopefully in the future, this will become less important, but at the moment, it feels like we need to face the reality that life in central Bedfordshire is very difficult without a car unless one lives in the most urban areas. And if you will bear with me, um, Nicholas, I'll, part, I'll go on to Debbie's second comment um, because you may want to wrap up your answer in discussing this wider point. 
I agree with a lot of what you say, but I'm concerned that if the government doesn't properly resource front loading the planning system, then the reforms will not work. I'm also concerned about the cost of resourcing design codes of, um, at a small enough scale to be meaningful. Do you have any thoughts on those matters, please? Again, all your questions are so good. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, so, Debbie, thank you for both of those. Uh, just on your first point, I mean, yes, I, I think that's, that is fair. It's not the ideal answer, but I think it is where we are. Um, and I think uh, my parents, by the way, live in, in mid Bedfordshire, or central Bedfordshire, as I think you know, is, um, uh, as I recognise that very much. I mean, I think all I'd say is that, and well, two things, you sort of feel that mid Bedfordshire should be somewhere where public transport gets better and should be doable because it's okay, it's not, you know, it's not the deep country, let's be honest with ourselves. Um, so that is frustrating, but that's not better yet. Um, uh, but because there is quite a lot of new development happening in the area, you know, the, the new development should be able to design in the potential for that slightly higher level of parking than is ideal. Um, and critically, and this is, you know, you should, should build in thoughts about the resilience and the future proofing so that if, hopefully, but you know, we can't control the future, uh, the car need in the future is reduced slightly, you know, you can just grass them over. They become parts of the, you know, internal courtyard or village green, or you can put a, you know, some sort of live work unit on them or whatever it might be. So I, I think that's the, that'd be the plea on that one. Um, Debbie. Uh, and then on your um, second one, which again, I think is a really, a really fair point. Um, I'm going to partly agree with it, partly disagree, but I'm going to largely agree. Um, I mean, yes, sh short answer. Yes. Um, I was very, <laughs> I think I can say this. So I was doing an interview uh, for, our, we ran a conference last year in which I was doing a and a with the Secretary of State. And I basically put that point to him. Uh, I put it with a smile and sort of tried to do it nicely. And he basically said yes as well. So we got us a public commit from it, commitment from him that that should happen. That doesn't turn into the Treasury agreeing to it, by the way, but, you know, it's, but it's a good start. Um, so I think that is recognised. And, um, you know, the money that is, uh, I can't say what it is at the moment, but which is going to uh, be supporting Office Replace and then some of the team that Joanna Avery, the chief planner, is currently recruiting. Uh, you know, th that's some recognition of that centrally. Um, that doesn't, hasn't yet transfer down to local councils, which I'm sure you had observed in my answer. Um, I don't have a wand to, to make that change. The one bit I'll say that you might disagree with, um, so apologies if that's the case. Um, I, do say, I do have to say that I think some of the stuff that has been said publicly by some people, I won't say who, um, about the cost of design codes is complete bullshit. Um, so, it, and I'm afraid I see sometimes uh, yeah. some people who are paid to do design codes saying that you have to spend at least 50 or hundred thousand pounds on them. And, and I, you know, that's just nonsense. Uh, and they, I mean, I know there are some design codes I've read done by reputable firms. Again, I'm afraid I'm not going to name them that are just bonkersly long, bonkersly complicated. And they're not really design codes. They're just long statements of stuff with far too many words. Doesn't help. And um, actually Matthew Carmona at the UCL is very good on this. Um, yeah, I, I think that there is some case to be made. I'm now speaking in a private capacity, I should emphasize, for saying that make them five pages long. I mean, really focus on the things that matter and don't turn them into industries and of, of just uh, you know, extraneous comment. And I think if there's a role, I hope that perhaps the office of place or something could play, it will be in giving councillors and their officials the confidence to focus purely on those things. Because we should be in a situation where... Um, you know, there are some things that are just regulated. If you want to build homes or create places here, you need to do this. And that's set sufficiently clearly in the local plan in the subsidiary documents. If you don't like that, don't bid for the land. OK, don't do it. Then there's some stuff which I think is legitimately advisory. Uh, you can get off this one, but we're going to make it hard. And then there's some stuff which is just we'd rather, we'd rather you did this. So if, if they're really clearly sort of, um, so, you know, uh, divided in that way. And that first one is one you realise it's incredibly hard. In fact, it's essentially impossible to wriggle off. Um, and you've got to have that purity. And for the record, maybe Crate Streets is rubbish, but you know, we do design codes for a lot less than 50K. You do not need to spend 50K on the design code. It's utter nonsense. So, so I do agree with your fundamental point, but don't be bullshitted by some of the people who make a good living in producing long development documents. That's it. That's my answer. If I, if I may butt in on this, on this one, we first worked with the Prince's Foundation back in 2012 uh, using uh, funding through them from the then DCLG on communities in planning program. And I have to, I haven't said it before, but I am, although I'm chair of Lux and Dorbans, I'm speaking in a personal capacity because we don't speak on behalf of people because we think they should be speaking themselves. We just bring people together and host community engagement through our charrettes. But our problem is we are a community group that wants to enable the community to have their say and work 
with landowners and developers, with planners, with all the with all professions and and, and and but with the community. But we struggle for funding. Uh, we're not a neighbourhood forum, so um, that was deemed at the time not to be right for the city centre of St Albans. Um, so we're always struggling for funding to to find that uh, to to enable us to carry on with our work. Um, and I can be pretty confident, I think, that the design codes that we co-created back in 2012 uh, were certainly nowhere near the figures that have been banded around. I mean, admittedly, they're, they're not a full set, but um, nowhere near that amount of money. Um, so I think there's a, a will and a way, um, but we do need funding as a, as a group and I will put that out there. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. That's, <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I, I can see we've got, we, I don't think we're going to get anywhere near through all out the questions in the chat, Nicholas, because I can see there are 40 outstanding at the moment. Mm -hmm. But we'll just do our last few because it's now 1921. So I'm, I'm working down, you know, um, question by question as they came in. So um, Dreda makes a comment, actually. The current system favours the developer and LA's fear the costs of appeals. That, Maybe that's I'll absolutely put in, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, I was going to actually do... Um, Two, two at once, and so Mike uh, makes the point. I agree with very very much that you say, but the 2050, or question mark 2030, zero carbon target for all houses probably entails that all new houses should be zero carbon. This will mean that they ought to generate energy, e.g. through solar design. I didn't though see in your sides any solar panels or shallower or even monopitch roofs optimised for renewable generation. I fear this is because beautiful in, in, in italics, um, or in quote marks, is sometimes conflated with old looking, again, in, um, Quote marks. And is also, and this also leads to use of high carbon materials, e.g., brick, cement, etc. Can beautiful not also be modern and zero carbon? So two rather different points, um, but you might want to have a have a go at those two, Nicholas. Uh, the, well, most people wouldn't regard cement as a traditional uh, material. Though of course, it was used um, by the Romans. So perhaps that's wrong with them. Um, uh, no, no, it's a it's a very it's a very good question. Um, I think two two thoughts. One is uh, I think. The, the, the focus certainly in the B4C report, and that's, I guess, reflected in my presentation, was to try and broaden the perception of sustainability. And what I think we came to the view on, and I still have this view, was that um, you know, people who've got things to sell you are overly and unreasonably dominating the conversation on what a sustainable home is. So it's been a very sort of fabric first approach, um, rather than a, what is the life that you lead in that home? And how long does that home exist? Uh, so you know, clearly, uh, uh, how efficient it is uh, and whether you can generate energy is important, very important. Uh, whether you walk to school or to the office or can cycle to your daily needs as opposed to having to get into a car is actually far more important in terms of your energy use. And whether the home that's built um, you know, lasts for 200 years or 300 years is also incredibly important Versus, the fact, I mean, I was going around, I won't say who, I was going around a uh, volume house builder site last week. And I think the guy said they were looking for it to last 40 years. Uh, I mean, it's just outrageous. So that, and by the way, that was bricks. Um, um, so these things matter too. So I, I guess to some degree, my confession, Mike, is I was deliberately emphasizing the other bits because I think they are, in some cases, more important, certainly as important, and they are outrageously underrepresented in the conversation. Um, but you're right that there are some tensions. I, I don't think cement is one of them. I think bricks is. Uh, we're in touch with the Future Homes Task Force, uh, the people who like, I'm trying to help them to set the new standards on this. I think the areas of possible tension are up bricks. Uh, and also, I think size. Uh, sorry, bricks are, are put on one on top of the other with cement. Uh, or, or, or lime mortar. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, Wood is clearly a better material for. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to try and argue that yeah. one because you're clearly right. Um, uh, but I think we need to look at the energy usage in the round, and we need to look about a popular support for housing. You know, a um, a brick. A, a, sorry, excuse me. A, you know, a wood framed uh, building with some bricks in and lots of greenery on it. I, I you know. I think is fine, and I think we must be careful of allowing purity. And I don't think you're implying this, Mike. So forgive me. Um, yeah, you know, we mustn't make absolute purity in one thing mean that we end up doing the wrong thing more broadly. So I think the point is fair. Um, just on, uh, you probably I suspect you know more about this than me. But clearly, the um, uh, 
uh, technology on uh, solar panels and energy generation that way is changing. Um, it's as everything I, everyone, I'm not an expert on this, but you know, everything I read tells me actually we're realizing that offshore wind power is really the game for this country and that we can pipe that in increasingly cheaply. That's not to say we shouldn't do solar generation. And clearly the solar generation technology is changing. And I'm informed by several people that we're not that far years off, many years off having you know, photovoltaics in what seem to be quite normal tiles and that they're getting more flexible in what they what what uh, uh, ratios and proportions they can use. I may not be right on that. So I sort of I'd be nervous about in in, dem, in you know creating mm. places that people don't wish to live mm. in on technology that's about to move. That, that'd be my only thing. But I think I think your challenge in question is very fair. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, and I think I mean there's a number of further comments about PV and uh, solar and and this whole area, Nicholas. But in the interests of of that, there are a number more kind of questions about other themes that it would be really good if we don't uh, you know if we can get to a couple more before we we finish. Um, um, one question that's coming up as a resu result of that that discussion was uh, from from Matthew, who asks, um, "How do we square providing enough parking with the urgent need for decarbonising transport in order to meet our 2030 carbon targets?" So this this uh, issue, uh, perhaps you might want to say a few words about that. Well, I sort of half touched on that in my answer to you the lady did. who asked a question about um, the fronts of houses. I, I'm not sure I've got a sort of silver bullet on this, I'm afraid, Matthew. And by the way, Matthew, it's nice to, nice to um, so it's not, not see you, but you're there, clearly. Um, um, uh, I mean, I think there was quite an important, I mean, there was quite an important statement last year in terms of active travel and the statement that was made, I think, earlier this year on buses. Um, uh, you know, the government public sector will need to, to fund some of this stuff. Uh, I think the more important one is making it easier actually to do active travel and uh, moving, because you know, the, the real thing that matters, obviously the journeys to work matters, but the, um, you know, the journeys around towns and cities. Uh, one easy thing that the government should do, or two easy things actually, one is clearly on all, well, make, make more clearly the distinction between roads that go from A to B and the, um, uh, if you like, the, the roads inside a settlement. And I would get quite radical about taking cars out of the, if you like, the streets inside an existing quite dense settlement, probably historic core or sub suburban core, you know, other than certain times of day or if you're disabled. So, you know, basically other than deliveries at certain times, just, just take them out. You know, I'd probably make that something that can be decided locally. You, you can't completely impose that, but make that the mandate and then allow local communities to come back if they really want to. Um, so I think that'd be one step. Two, on the, if you like, the roads that go from A to B, and it's very much the Dutch model, you know, put in that, you know, where you are going to still have cars for the foreseeable future, and perhaps arguably always, um, they'll probably be electric and they'll probably be less polluting, is just put in, you know, the, the segregated uh, routes for cycling, or, and this is my third point, uh, or for um, uh, electric scooters. And it is just ridiculous that it's only a few pilots of, of hired uh, electric scooters uh, there are in a few cities that is permitted. It's clearly, and it's going to electric bikes. This is probably the key change. It's interesting. I live in South London. I, it, I think in the last sort of two months almost, the number of kids, and they are mainly kids, on electric scooters I'm seeing is just doing that. It, the technology's come, it's there. Uh, it's absolutely got to be legalized. Um, it is insane that it's not. So those would be my three things. But, but Matthew, that won't actually answer your question, but it's the best I can do, I'm afraid. I think I think those are probably the, the right first steps. But Active Travel England is the great hope because they do have budget and they are they are coming. Um, Nicholas, thank you. We've got about two minutes left and there's a rather a long kind of comment sort of question from Steve about hospital placement. I'm not going to try and read the whole thing to you because we're getting very close to the wire now, but just really, really, I think, focusing in on what would be an appropriate location for, for a hospital to really, I think, meet this, the kind of challenge that, 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 your, that your arguments are presenting us with. Um, and I also wanted to say to all the 42 other messages Sorry. from people that we haven't got to know, it's, it's a testament to how engaged everyone is with what you're, you're we're talking about tonight, Nicholas, and, and so really it's a testament to you, actually. Um, and you will be able to see all this when I, we share, the, share this re re recording. So for those things we haven't managed to get to. But did you want to say anything about, you know, health service provision, you know, location um, comments just briefly before we finish? Um, yeah, I, I, actually, I've been doing some work on this recently, but I, I wouldn't claim deep expertise on this. Um, as probably most of you know, uh, there are essentially you know, three types of uh, hospital, primary, secondary, tertiary. Um, primary and secondary, I, more normal hospitals, and for ongoing support, should be firmly, physically closely, and strongly embedded and embodied, I'm not getting my words wrong, in the uh, settlements and places that they serve. Um, my ideal hospital would be you know, in the town, 
with a, a, a lovely, uh, beautiful complex of buildings around courtyards with gardens, but actually spilling out into the existing streets, quite the quiet streets, so that there is a, you know, almost a mingling of the bloods and the ways between the hospital and the town or the village or the bit of the city or the suburb that it serves. So there's some bits which are very safely, you know, private and you know, secured for people who, who need that type of comfort and, and safety and care, but other bits start mingling into the world and, and the streets around them. And you can imagine, forgive me, this might sound a little bit eccentric, um, you know, if you can imagine the model of uh, Oxbridge Colleges, where you've got the quads and the courts interangling with some of the existing public highways, you could imagine uh, that where you even have bridges across streets so that you, know, you can have secure interaction between um, different walls or places. So that would be the answer for the, the first two types. They should be embodied. And that also is good for, obviously, the, um, to Mike's earlier question, to the, uh, um, uh, you know, the carbon footprint of the people who work in or use that hospital because they can cycle or walk there as opposed to having in the car, which I suspect is what happens with most modern hospitals, which is sort of done over there. Um, that said, that's not all hospitals because there are, uh, you know, the tertiary hospitals, the long-term recovery hospitals, by their, def by their, by their nature are more specialist, um, they're not going to be serving one community. And there's a recent one that John Simpson built uh, uh, you know, for recovering servicemen. Yeah, that is a specialist hospital. It won't be local. It can't by its definition. I think that's reasonable. That is put in a beautiful rolling part of the English countryside. Actually, something very similar to what I described. It's a beautiful place set around gardens, um, but is not embodied in a community, but it is embodied in, uh, in nature. And we know very very clearly from the evidence. I mean, I think you know, without caveat, the similar point I was making about street trees, you know, the biophilic consequence of greenery on our health and our mental health and our ability, our capacity to, you know, to, to heal uh, is, is, is unambiguous. The, literally, I think the first biophilic study was done by, um, uh, who was it done? I can't remember his name, but was done into a comparison of um, a hospital patients in two wards in the States and showed that the ones in the ward that looked out on greenery, you know, recovered quicker and <laughs> stayed healthy longer. Um, so, uh, you know, hospitals, they, they're going to stop being just sort of factories for fixing and they have to become profounder places for healing. Uh, there you go. That's my, that's my off the cuff answer in hospitals. But I, as I say, there's lots I don't know about hospitals. Thank you, Nicholas. That's, that's fantastic. And I think that probably is where we're going to have to leave it for this evening. Um, I just want to say in the chat, there's been really a lot of really interesting discussion about the kind of a beautiful and sustainable interplay between movement and place. And I think you've touched on a number of those points tonight. Um, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to kind of draw your attention to all the things um, that people have, have commented on or questions they've asked. But I just want to say a huge thank you to you and to Vanessa, um, you know, for a sort of brilliant presentation, fielding, you know, a great variety of questions. Um, so so adeptly and, and you know really providing us with just a wealth of 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 knowledge understanding and um thoughts about design i've tried to be socially intelligent and not ask all the questions i'd like to about you know about education about shopping post covid and all sorts of things that you know that you, you raised but it's been a really fascinating session tonight and many thanks to vanessa at books and albans and to you for coming along and sharing your time and your incredible expertise with us um it's fantastic um, before we all go, I just wanted to say we have got another seminar coming up on July 29th, uh, 1600, 1800, in which our, um, our visiting professor, Stephen Joseph, is going to be uh, talking about the future of transport outside cities. And I think it's picking up a number of you much you better answers than I did on that. Well, I think it's really will fit in very nicely and actually connect up. So looking at some outcomes and conclusions from a series of roundtables, we've been, we've been, our smart mobility unit has been running, exploring that topic, which I think has got a lot to do with what you've been talking about tonight. I, so, cer I yes. certainly will be looking forward to that one with Stephen. Yeah. Definitely. May I just thank you Please. also, Susan, and to John for hosting this tonight in a joint uh, sem you know, seminar with Lips and Dorbans. Uh, we have a good working relationship for a long time. And uh, thank you, Nicholas, so much from, from us um, <laughs> for giving a wonderful presentation and giving your time freely with, for us tonight. So well, thank, thank you. you very much for asking me and thank you all for listening. I, I'm sorry I went on probably a bit too long. And uh, no, no, as no. I say, no, Vanessa has been an absolute lodestar in, yeah. in sort of what work I've done. I'm, I'm very, I've always held her up as an example of, of what you should all do. So well done, Vanessa, mm -hmm. and to all of you who work with her. So uh, <laughs> many thank you to, to Nicholas, Vanessa, to John Conlon, who's helped um, organise the session, and to all our participants for giving your time too and your excellent questions and comments in the chat. It's all been brilliant this evening. Really um, very grateful to you. Uh, we will be, um, I've been filming this, so I will be looking for a way to share that with you if I can manage to do that. 
thanks all. I'm going to draw the session to a close. Many thanks, Nicholas. Um, thank you. Thank all. you, Susan. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.